Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm here today with a special guest for you, Nicholas DiLorenzo from Panorama Mixing and Mastering. Uh, Nicholas and I have been chatting over the past couple of months and kind of getting to know each other on YouTube, and I'm really happy to be able to bring him to you guys today. Um, Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. Right on. Yeah. So, so to give everybody a bit of background, kind of how this connection happened, um, I started having some colleagues of mine, people that I, I respect a lot, sending me Nicholas's videos as he was doing them. Cause I'm very much in the world of, of mixing and mastering and geeking out on plugins and techniques. And I had some people in my world that are really legit engineers that were saying, Hey, we're seeing some really neat videos, um, that this guy's doing. And I started watching them and, uh, I started to just appreciate what it is that you were bringing to the table. And, uh, it's been really amazing to see somebody who has like the legit chops and is working in the industry, cranking out a ton of mixes and masters as a professional engineer and someone who is, uh, you know, dives deep into plugins, reads the manuals, um, really does the thorough research and shares very legitimate and and very professional knowledge. It's rare to see people like that. And that's um, how we connected. I think I started commenting on some of your videos and we, we had a bit of banter back and forth. Um, we were looking into some of the same tools at the same time. We knew some of the same people like Luca Pratilesi and, and Ian Shepard uh, or Ian Stewart. Um, and uh, we were looking at the Baselane Pro plugin. And yeah, so I just, there was lots of overlap. Um, I reached out to Nicholas a while back and asked if uh, he'd be interested in coming on board and doing an interview. And it's uh, finally shown up. So here we are today. Yeah, it's it's been a real pleasure. Um, you've been a really good contributor, uh, as in I enjoy doing these videos, and it's really good to have um, you know another professional alongside to give valuable insight um, and almost like a a second lens um, to see to just learn from because uh, a lot of us operate in silos sometimes outside of our clients and the projects we're working on. We, we can tend to get isolated in our own thought and opinion. So I, I always really welcome and I'm always really excited to see when um, you contribute to something um, as much as I do. So yeah, th th thanks for the connect. Thanks for connecting and creating this connection. You know, you initiated them. I think that's, I'm grateful for it. Thanks, Ben. Well, my, my intention for the interview is, um, uh, we have about an hour and a half, so we'll see how much of that time we use. Uh, Nicholas has been very generous with his time. He's a, an incredibly busy engineer. He's one of the busiest people that I know in the industry. So um, we're going to max out the the next hour and a half that we have together. And I've got a series of questions and we'll see where it goes. I mean, we might go deep into one topic and totally skip over some of the other things that I'd intended to ask. But in general, the ground I wanted to cover is kind of sectioned into going into a bit of your background, you know, how you arrived in this place and career path in the industry. Um, I want to go into some of what you do, you know, the type of kind of unique aspect of mixing and mastering that you specialize in, the type of clients you work with, some of the tools and techniques that you use and employ in what you do, um, and then kind of wrap up with, uh, you know, what it's like being in the industry these days. What what does your life look like as a as a prolific uh, engineer and YouTuber? Um, and yeah, that's kind of the the broad scheme of things. So we'll start with just the the background piece. Um, you know, and we've talked, of course, a bit offline, you and I, but um, how did you start off in the industry? How did you get into, you started off doing mastering, right? You started as a mastering engineer first. Yeah. So uh, what happened was I really loved recording. So high school, recording your own bands, whatnot, went to university or college um, over in the States for it. And then got an internship at a recording studio, realized I can't do the hours. I don't have the interpersonal skills to manage musicians in the studio, especially um, when they're being creative. That takes a certain interpersonal skill set, which I didn't have. Um, and then I accidentally fell into, accidentally is, um, I have 30, 40 different studios sending out my resumes to, and whichever one picked it up, I was going to just sort of roll with the, roll with the punches and accidentally fell into an internship position at a mastering studio, realized that the workflow, the culture, the way, uh, mastering sessions operate and the business operates was better suited for my skill sets and then assistant, then off the back of that, doing freelance work and then building my own space. Awesome. And, um, at what point did you start Panorama and kind of, uh, go out on your own? 
So uh, in the last year at being an assistant, I was doing a lot of freelance work um, and the business model had changed because as in the business model was in this trans- transitory period. This is 2013, 2014. Um, the mastering engineer I was an assistant for had moved out of a large commercial space into his pl- into his own home, um, and I was assisting him there. It was a big house. It, it wasn't, you know, like it, it was a really well facilitated space, um, but the scope wasn't there and the scale wasn't there to come on as a full time engineer or employee in that in that capacity. So I sort of saw the writing on the wall. It's like I got this freelance thing, getting an employment or gaining an employment. Um, at the scale or, or to be in a position where I could grow my career wasn't an option. Um, so sort of like take the freelance, build my own company, combine the two and then build my own career from it. Um, rather than trying to rely on, on, on an outside party to make that happen. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, w- you know, when you've, when you've got kind of a ceiling or some type of limitation on how far you can grow in a certain environment, then it makes sense, especially if you have the entrepreneurial inclination, which it sounds like you, you definitely have in spades. So that's cool. And then, and then you started to, you started Panorama. And then at some point you, um, you also got into doing mixing. So how did that transition happen? Uh, accidentally. So I was just mastering and then people were like, Oh, you do mastering, do you do mixing? Or we've got this mix uh, or we want you to master, but can you fix a few things? And that was sort of just like a natural transition. It started off as like three, four mixes a year. Then it was like 14 mixes. Then it was like 60 mixes. And I think like last year I did over 70 mixes. And this year it, it's well into a scale that, you know, I've for the last uh, year and a bit, I've had an assistant helping me set everything up and I think this year we'll definitely go over a hundred mixes. Um, which again, that, that was like a byproduct of just a, like word of mouth in the background, sort of doing its own thing. Totally. Yeah. I mean, when you're in the business of making music sound its best, and, and of course, mastering is part of that and mixing is part of that. So it makes sense that there's overlap there. Um, but uh, yeah, there's mastering engineers out there who that's all they do. And then there's mix engineers out there that that's all they do. And they refuse to, you know, they, they like to just stay in their lane, so to speak. And then there's people out there like myself as well, who are, you know, I, I like to be able to do both. And I, 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 I really enjoy doing both. And I think there's benefit to, to being able to see something all the way through the process. So, so that's neat. So what, what, um, what types of adjustments did you find you needed to make to get into mixing um, aside from purely focusing on the mastering process. The adjustment was just, it was just like starting to walk again. So it was like people came in with a small problem. Like I can't get my kick drum to work in the mix. All right. And then they're like, we want you to mix it. So I start mixing it and I'm just focused on that one thing. The next one might be my vocals are moving all around. And then, so I was learning as a professional at the same pace, people who were starting to learn mixing were, it was just that I had access to, I had access to the tool sets because I had the investment in the studio, which was fortunate. I had access to the knowledge because I'd learnt in system positions and in freelancing and engaging as a mastering engineer. Um, it, it, it was a humbling experience because uh, as exciting as many people might think it is to be getting mixing projects in and working on things, it was me banging my head against a wall trying to make things work for a long time and still is like that. Um, because it's it's not my main sort of pathway. Even if you go on my website, um, you won't see anything about mixing on there. There'll be there's like an inquiry form in the very bottom footer, but the rest of it's all my mastering credit um, and labels I've worked for mastering. It's nothing mixing. I just because again that's self fulfilling on the side. I'm not too stressed about growing that because I just don't have the scale or ability to. Yeah. Speaking of that, how about how long are you finding it takes you to do a mix and how long are you finding it takes you to do your average master? And of course, it's going to vary depending on the number of tracks and the complexity of the song, but I'm just curious. Yeah, so uh, a mastering session, um, let's, uh, most people think of the mastering session as when you drop it into your door and you start working on it. Um, if that's the case, it's about 30 to 45 minutes. 
I consider the mastering session from the QC before that. So it could be me having a time listening to it, sending back notes to the client back and forth a bit. So it ends up comping to about an hour's worth, if not a little bit more of work per master. Um, for mixing, it can range. There are some mixes I can get done in two hours or two and a bit hours and the client is signing off on the first one. They're happy. It's all good. Um, there are other ones where I might spend 10, 11, 12 hours and that's perfectly fine as well. Um, I've set up my rate structure in such a way that uh, I'm costing for results, not time. So mm -hmm. I will throw everything in the kitchen sink at a mix to make sure that uh, my clients are leaving above and beyond happy. That comes at a very premium cost, but it means that I never have to stress about anything. You know, sometimes even clients in the middle of a project have sent me a whole new set of stems and I'm like, yep, that's cool. I push it through to my system. You know, I cost it wow. all in and I'm like, yeah. it's, it's, it's just an easier way to work. I'll give you an example. Actually, this is getting great. I had an email this morning from a client where my assistant had flagged with me the stems. There were some things that were out of key and they had made them inactive. So I didn't have them running in the session. I mixed the songs and I accidentally made them active before bouncing. And the client was a bit stressed about it. They're like, Oh, there are things that are really out of key here. And I'm like, uh Oh, this is my bad. Um, so I quickly go on the phone. I go, Hey, and they were worried about revisions. How many revisions? And I go, don't worry. This is on me. I'm going to get this all fixed up. Um, that that's not on you to stress. It's not an extra revision. It's not an extra cost. Like that's how I like to operate that because I don't like my clients worrying about, you know, how many revisions, if they can do this, if they can do that, if they can't do this, it's just like once you pass that threshold yeah. of a Ford in the mix, it's free game. It's like we can do anything you want. I really like that approach of paying for results. Um, you know, I've I've been an entrepreneur since I was 19 years old. I've always been running my own things, whatever they might be. Um and I, I really like that mindset of you have somebody, they're going to invest um, some of their hard-earned money into something. It doesn't really, they don't care how many hours it takes really at the end of the day. Um, uh, what they care about is I pay for something and I get something that's expected. And, and I think that's really smart as a, as a engineer and as an entrepreneur to be able to offer that for people. And of course, on some of the projects, you're going to kind of lose out because they're going to take a lot longer than you think. And then on some projects, they're going to go and flow faster than you expected. And it all evens out in the end, like you said. Yeah, but it's, it, it's also an, an opportunity to learn cost, which I think is really good. See, if I limited mm -hmm. my clients to, X amount of revisions and then you have to pay me per hour and you, you can only do it this way and that's the way we're going to do it. It doesn't open yourself up to new opportunities. Um, some examples of this would be like plugins like Trigger. I never used to do like uh, resampling in my mixes. Now I, you know, because a client wanted a different kick, I've got Trigger. And if I hadn't have allowed for that opportunity, uh, I wouldn't have explored a new tool or same with Vocaline and other tools which I'm using in my sessions. It opens up the opportunity to learn new things, learn new tools, because you get to feel their pain points and have the opportunity to address each of their pain points without them having a consideration of, oh, this is going to cost me more money, this, that, the other. You just take that off the table. But that's that's a certain luxury that can only be afforded at a certain stage um, because people starting out can't necessarily yeah. charge the highest ticket what you need to for mixes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Totally. Um, I'd like to talk for a little bit about, um, cause you're somebody, um, that sees an incredible amount of mixes, you know, any, any, you know, professional full-time mastering engineer is going to see a lot of different mixes from a lot of different artists. And I'm curious what you see, um, some of the biggest and most common mistakes that you're seeing in, in mixes, because you're also a mixer, you know, things that you're like, Oh, I would have done this differently. Is, are you, are you noticing a lot of the same things recurring? And if so, what are they? Um, I think it's care and attention to the consistency of elements. So uh, let's say there's there's a kick and a bass. Uh, the, the the kick, there's like a, a sustain that's like way out of line and way too loud. Or the bass line, as it moves through different registers, um, I'm not a, a complete nerd on um, sound design and synthesis, but uh, with wavetable synthesis, as you go through different registers, if there's different oscillators, they phase differently. So you get louder notes and softer notes and, and brighter notes and more aggressive notes and more dulled out notes. 
And mixing engineers aren't taking the time to consider how each of those notes translate when they're mixing. They're just sort of like, oh, I'm going to throw a compressor on it all and let it go. And then you end up with this like very yeah. lopsided sort of mixes. So uh, having consideration of that, and that's exactly the same for vocals. Um, you know, a vocals will move in and out. They'll have a bit more proximity, a bit less proximity. Um, just going into each word and going, okay, this one, there's a boomy frequency at 180 hertz. I'm going to just take this word, add a little notch on it. So it's more consistent with everything. You can use dynamic EQs and other automated things, but, uh, when you actually go over every, like as a mixing engineer, when I go over every single word on every single take, it allows me to really dial it in perfectly before I even start pulling faders. Yeah, totally. And there are tools that can help you to to do that efficiently. Like there, there's a lot of different ones you could use. Melodyne for that. You can use RX for that. And I know you're a big Isotope RX guy. So um, yeah, that's that's neat. And anything else pop to mind as as common things that you see in terms of kind of stuff in in mixes that you would you would want to correct? I'm, I'm going to circle back to you on the Melodyne thing in a second, but I'll finish answering your, your sure. question. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Go for it. So. It's it's generally consistency, and that usually comes from how much attention or duty of care you're giving to the material. Um, a, a common question people ask is, should I leave my mix bus on or off or whatnot? Uh, for me, it's always uh, whatever the client signs off on is the mix I should get. Um, if you feel like you need to send an alternate, like one without your limiter on or whatnot, do that, but label it clearly which one the artist or the label have signed off on which one they haven't. So that way I know exactly what everybody else who's a party to the project has heard. Um, that's a common one because sometimes I get some doozies where it's like, oh, I turned off this saturator and this limiter, but I left this EQ on and like 50%, it's like a Frankenstein chain of what people actually heard on that final mix bus. Um, that, would, that, that would be the second thing. But the first thing is duty of care. That's like, you can have an imperfect mix, like let's say it's not well balanced and it might have a few little quirks, which might not be technically right. But if you've given each element good TLC in terms of the bass is consistent, the kick is nice and tight and the vocals are good. Um, if a synth comes in like three decibels loud, who cares? Like we, we can manage Like even though it might not be perfect, the general feel of the track comes along to the listener and that's better than having everything perfect. And then, on a macro level, but on a micro level, there are little things which are going in and out, distracting people. Um, circling back to the Melodyne, I need to make a personal yes. note for myself because um, I've had a few people mention it. What's the exact feature you're using in Melodyne when you're working on vocals outside of tuning to manage those little inconsistencies? Yeah, totally. So I, I use Melodyne and I, I was trained on Melodyne by one of the engineers at, um, that had worked at Metropolis in London. Um, yeah. and so we'd worked on like Adele and Amy Winehouse and stuff like that. And he was just like the guy that people go to, to, um, to Melodyne vocals. And he, he kind of showed me his process. So I definitely use it for tuning. Um, I use it for DSing, um, because you can okay. split off that material using the split function. And I, um, I use it for timing. Um, although in Ableton live, a lot of times I'm using warping for timing, but the big one is manual, um, basically manual compression um similar to um taking Plays clip game rider? um different than that because that's a single effect that's riding up and down so like in okay. melodyne it's it splits the vocal into what they call blobs and it's basically syllables um and you can change the, the slicing points, but basically it, it slices everything up into individual syllables of, of the vocal. And then you can use the, the amplitude tool to just gain up quieter parts and gain down louder parts on a blob by blob or syllable by syllable basis. And you can even can it, split off. And that's how I do de-essing and, and plosive reduction. If you want to get really granule, cause you can split the plosives is, um, so it's very manual, but. Oh, it's very manual. So there's not an automated process behind the hood that can manage it? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I'm still running Melodyne okay. 4, which is outdated now, but I would always go in and, you know, that stuff, it's kind of like, do you put a de on something or do you go in and manually do it? I mean, if, if your client has the budget for it, usually you're going to get better results by going in and gaining each yeah. word or syllable differently. It's like you said, sometimes there's proximity, sometimes they're a little further away from the mic. And I always just think... 
how is the message getting across? Is there intelligibility in what this vocalist is trying to convey? And some of the words, if some of the words are getting lost, this helps me avoid overusing compression, saturation, limiting on the vocal. And then I can be much less heavy handed with that stuff and, and, and still get the, get the message to come through. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Cause the way I do my blobs quote unquote is cutting up the regions as I'm listening to it. Whereas this seems to automatically pull yeah. it in and re- and it's auto blobbing and then you can choose what to do. Okay, cool. Uh, tune yeah. D- I think that's the hack function. with Melodyne. Yeah. yeah. That's the neat part is that it automatically slices out the individual, um, the individual syllables, blobs. the blobs. And whereas if you're doing it in wave, uh, you know, in, in an audio track in your DAW, um, you'd have to manually slice everything up. I mean, and that's a valid approach too. That can, that can totally yeah. work. And that's how a lot of people do it too. Yeah. I've got Maladon. I just never use any of those functions. It's always been like for when clients have said, Oh, that one note is a bit out of tune. And then I just go in and do that one note. Um, so, uh, uh, Maladyne, DS a split function. It automatically populates the blobs and then you can either manually compress it with amplitude or manage plosives and sibilants separately. But those yeah. blobs are, are chunks of syllables. Okay, cool. Sorry. Just want to take it. that down. And one additional layer to that that I'll mention is, um, is, um, you know, sibilants and plosives don't pitch well. And so when Melodyne tries to do pitch correction, um, sometimes that's noticeable on the plosives and on the sibilants. And so you can actually, one of the techniques that I would do is split off the S's and the F's and the, and the plosives and have them unpitched. Um, so that's another, mm. another little added benefit of Melodyne that, uh, you don't get, um, in a lot of other platforms. Does it, does it self identify what's sibilance and what plosive or that's just sort of done in the audition when you're auditioning? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like reasonable. RX where you can see it in the spectrum. You know, you kind of just get yep. used to what stuff looks like. Yep. No, that's perfect. Yeah. Good. Good. I, I've been lazy on that. And since you mentioned it, I'm like, okay, no, I just got to get some keynotes here because I've got Melodyne. I just haven't explored it in that sense. Cool. Thank you. Right on. Yeah. And and thank you. I'll have to say I, I felt the same way about RX that you do probably about Melodyne is that I'd have had RX for a long time. I've used it for dialogue editing, but I'd never used it to prep my masters. And I watched your video, one of your videos about your workflow in RX, and it was just absolutely floored me, man. I was like, wow, this is such a powerful tool, how you were doing manual um, limiting. Um, on just a couple of samples at a time uh, to clean up stray peaks and stuff. And I was like, whoa, okay. And then you were showing how you're using some of the different modes to adjust maybe kick or bass and, and things like that. So that was a, in, that was a in, fantastic video that I learned a lot from. That was in spectrogram mode, correct? The kick and the bass? Yeah, okay, cool. You got it. Yeah. And you were, I, you were showing just... the different uh, like FFT settings and stuff like that? Ah, oh, good. Okay, beautiful. I was making sure I, because I was about to say, um, if you're in RX, it's worth reading the manual so you can understand the different FFT settings and the, you know, the different, um, graphing modes, extended log mal. I was just about to say, if you're, if you're getting into RX, you should definitely read the manual so you can get granular on it because you can totally some really good data. Um, cool. I'm happy I did that in that video. I forgot if I had or had not done the spectrogram settings. Um, but it sounds like I did. Yeah. Good on me. Yeah. It was Uber. It was Uber nerd mode video very one of the one of the one of the videos that definitely grabbed my attention and got me to follow your channel so oh cool that's awesome very cool well moving along let's let's kind of get into um the broad topic of mastering and um you know you're doing this as a professional but i'm sure you know on youtube you're seeing people that are maybe novice engineers kind of try their hand at it um, and maybe some of your clients, you're getting, you know, test masters that they do. Um, what do you think are some of the kind of biggest and most common mastering mistakes that, that people make when they're either starting to learn it themselves or, or they're an artist who's kind of trying to do their own, like, you know, test master to send to a label or something? I think um, the biggest mistake I see is a reliance on the tools themselves. Because I get so many emails, and I'm sure you get so many emails like this as well. Oh, should I buy this tool for my mix bus, or should I buy X Y Z? Um, or I'm using this Abbey Road emulation master bus because it gets this sound because I saw somebody use it. I think that's the biggest limiting factor because what happens is they'll mix a song. Um, Maybe one time this tool works, maybe when they follow a tutorial online exactly step by step for a particular track that's produced identical to the one in a video, it works. 
but then they're not left with the practical knowledge to apply anything outside of that realm. So they end up choking when it comes to like another mix they're doing and they do the same thing and they're like, oh shit, my fix, my mix is falling apart. Um, this isn't good. That's probably the biggest mistake is relying on any singular particular tool. Um, and this is something even for myself, I've had to like sort of, um, let go of, uh, my biases and my comforts with my tools. Cause I can do the same thing and it's not uncommon, but the difference is, uh, a, no- a novice will blame the tool and they'll go, this tool isn't working the way it did on the last one, or they'll self blame their mix and they'll go, Oh, my mix is really bad because this tool isn't working on it. When in fact, uh, there's just a knowledge gap there, a really wide knowledge gap, which needs to be filled. And that's a really hard knowledge gap to fill because it's not something that you just read a singular piece of information and it closes the experience of a decade or two decades of doing the work. It's, you know, that's probably the biggest yeah. problem I, I would say. Yeah, fair. And I think that um, in in reference to you know seeing a tool being used in a particular way by a certain engineer, or it might be a video, and and there's there's great platforms out there now that are teaching a lot of this stuff. There's Mix with the Masters, and and there's um, you know Luca's uh, My Mix Lab, and then there, of course everything on YouTube. So you you get a chance to see these um, kind of celebrity engineers a lot of times, like Luca. Um, doing certain things. And uh, it's it's kind of seductive to think that, oh, uh, that's a technique. I'm going to use this on my song. Uh, but a lot of times it's a very situation specific application of that tool. And like it works on like a Skrillex track that he's mixing, but it really doesn't work on a, a house track or something like that. So I think, um, yeah. The, and, and like you said, it doesn't fill the knowledge gap of, okay, well, how do I take this technique? Is this even an appropriate tool or technique to be using in this scenario? Yeah. I, I will, I will say something which is, which is interesting. And this is when it comes to like filtering audio education, because there's so many different platforms. I think the one thing I look for, cause I also consume that education as much as I put it out there. One thing I look for is how the presenter contextualizes the information for the situation. Um, context is really an important thing. So when you're coming to learn about something, it shouldn't be about 2 dB at 1 kilohertz or 2 to 1 ratio on compressor. It should be, there should be more backstory behind that and more front story after that to understand the result. Um, and that's what anybody who's listening to this should be trying to observe in the content they're engaging with to go, okay, I'm learning about this vocal editing technique with Melodyne. All right. Well, how was the vocal before it came in? What were they listening to before they even pulled up Melodyne? And afterwards, like, you know, how you said, uh, sibilance and plosives don't pitch well. Um, you know, how is that affected when he starts to compress it and EQ it and that effect? So you got that context before and after. That's that's a really healthy way to engage in that content rather than just looking for the center bit. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think that when you're a when you're a beginner or even if you're just somebody who's trying to get results really quickly, it can be really um, a bit of a rabbit hole to get down to think that there's these formulas that are universal. And you kind of you, you see this thing and it's like, oh you you like something that you hear is oh there's the, a muddy region between x and x number of hertz and if you pull that out you'll get more clarity on your bass and then somebody just goes and by default does that on every song um and you know we know that every song needs its own treatment and you you really do have to listen to it and and like you said context is 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 critical and um there aren't these universal formulas in in most cases and this this is just like a word of warning for like the, those muddy cuts in the low mids. Um, typically, why, why people as mixing engineers or mastering engineers have got to build up there isn't because they're muddy frequencies. It's actually, in my experiences, because of bad arrangement. Um, you have the harmonics of the bass at between 
let's say you've got a sub bass, your third order harmonics, if you've got a sub bass at 50, 60 hertz, your th- third order at 150, 180. You've got a male vocal who's a little bit low in register, their fundamentals at about 220, 230. You've got a synth pad that's, you know, voiced in an octave below middle A. Uh, middle A is 440, so you're at 220 hertz again there with the pad. And then you've got a snare drum where the beef of it's in the same spot. And it's, you cut all that out, you lose all that energy and you get a mix that sounds like it's too bright and boomy at the same time because you're trying to duck all those, that low mid energy. Um, whereas it's, especially for producers who are producing the stuff, it's good to think of it in an arrangement perspective to go, okay, I've got this sub bass line, um, and it's got harmonics up here. So what I'm going to do is with my male lead I'm looking for, instead of a, a tenor, I might look for like an alto lead where they sit a little bit higher up in the register so their fundamentals are away from the harmonics of the bass and for the snare drum i'm going to make sure the snare drum doesn't hit at the same time the bass is hitting because i do want that thump that that thickness to come out but i'm going to even change it not just frequency wise but uh, across the time domain so yeah i would just say word of warning don't cut muddy frequencies if you're the producer you can always look to the actual arrangement of the track because that is the healthiest way to make space for a good sounding record rather than just going, that's muddy frequency. It's not muddy frequency. It's usually because um, people for lack of otherwise knowing uh, inadvertently just piling their arrangement into the low mids. Cause that's where ears gravitate towards like a human voice is around a, a center a, maybe a little bit lower. So all the elements we put are usually around there and then they build up and you can't cut those fundamental frequencies because then you just got harmonics and harmonics are great, but it's that, that then it, everything sounds filtered and weird. Sorry to go on on about that, but I really wanted to make a good case for that so people can think about what they're doing and then, you know, create a pragmatic plan um, that helps them strongly in the future of their, their records. A hundred percent. No, that's one of the, exactly the type of tidbit that I think is is great when we when we do these types of interviews and you kind of come up with some of these uh, happy accidents that topics that you you hop into where obviously the depth of your experience in working with songs you can name specific frequencies and specific elements that are that are contributing to this and that's helpful for people to know for sure um, yeah. in terms of uh, I wanted to ask you this actually so when you're mastering um, sometimes you're gonna work with what you're given and you're going to be able to to work your way around some problems by maybe getting a little bit more heavy handed or using some of your tools to to be able to dig into um, something. And it's an issue with the mix. But then sometimes you're going to say, OK, I'm going to send some notes back to the mixer and um, I'm going to ask them to do a couple things on their end and then send it back to me. T- tell me a bit about that process, how that works with you. How do you decide what you what you send back to someone? What types of things might you send it back for versus just doing it on, on your end and, and getting the job done? Okay, so the first assumption I need to always make, and anybody who's in mastering should always make, is that this mix is signed off on and they're happy with it, regardless of what your own prejudices are into, or biases in terms of I like things that are more basic or things that are more aggressive or things with brighter lead line. doesn't matter. You have to assume that that is what's signed off on. That's what they're creatively happy with. Um, the lens I'm listening to it through as a mastering engineer is I've got their brief, let's say references or comments they've made. So that's, that's their North star they're aiming towards. And then I've got their mix. And then it's for me to go objectively, is there anything in this mix stopping me from taking it from where it is to where they want it? And if there is, that's when I give notes. Um, otherwise, like there, there are mixes which are way too warm or that, that I would say are way too bassy or the, the vocals are way too loud, but they line up with what they're saying and what they're wanting. So it's not for me to start becoming subjective and going, oh, you know, that vocal's too loud. And they're like, but we like that vocal. At least this way I can back my notes up when I do send a request to go, hey, this is what you want. These elements are working against that. Or it's going to make it more difficult to get there. You should consider doing X, Y, Z it's way more palatable and it ends up producing results that I know a hundred percent when they get it back, they're like really happy for it. Cool. Yeah. Great, great answer. Really, you know, totally makes sense and, and well thought out. And that, that comes from having the attitude of, of a professional, right? Having your brief, like you said, the comments references and just thinking objectively versus getting into, do I like this? Would I have done this as a mixer? And I know for me, I, 
when I've taken on mastering clients, I, cause I started the other way around from you. I started off as a mixer and then I started mastering, um, for very similar reasons. I just stumbled into it cause my clients were like, well, could you master this for me? We're already working with you on the mix. Um, but for me coming as a background, as a mixer and listening to, if I'm just doing mastering and somebody's sending me a mix, um, it's so hard for me not to get step into the subjective realm of it and, and get be like, well, I would have mixed it a little differently or something. You know, I, I found that personally very difficult and I've had to just, like you said, just go hands off on it and be, to be totally objective, just being like, what do you want this to sound like at the end of the day? Objectively, how can we get there? And is, and is there anything that would be getting in the way of that? So yeah, I like that. I like that. That's helpful for me to hear too. Awesome. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when you were just kind of, you know, a novice yourself and you were, you were apprenticing, you were getting into mastering, what, what types of things did you, if you have a recollection of this, what types of things did you struggle with personally? And then what did you do to overcome those? I, th I, I think the biggest struggle is because at that stage, uh, at least this is my personality and this is my type. I'm a sponge. I can soak up a lot of knowledge and understand a lot of what's going ar on around me in sessions and whatnot. Um, so I never had any issue with the tools per se or understanding the processes. It was mainly the uh, two things, and I s touched on this earlier, um, interpersonal skills, so understanding how to read somebody's wants and needs and interact with them. And uh, number two was my listening sensibilities, which ties into the interpersonal skills because I don't know how to articulate this yet, and maybe this is something I need to explore deeper on my own outside of the podcast, uh, outside of this uh, interview, but I can't say I'm alone and you, ha you have to back me up here, Drew, if you've experienced this, but when somebody, you're working on a project, uh, somebody's talking to you about a specific note and you know in your gut what to do, like you know, you got that gut feeling, that vocal just has to come up for them to be happy, regardless if, like we said, we, we have our biases, we accept it or not, we got that gut feeling. Um, so the biggest gap as a novice is understanding uh, what people are communicating to you and how you're hearing things and your listening sensibilities. That's probably like the five seconds I could have just said to answer that, but it's something that uh, the better I am at navigating interactions between my clients and translating that into action, and following my gut with that, not, not, not going, oh, that's because I'm going to do this regardless of what they say, or they ask for it three dB up. I'm only putting it one dB up because I only want it a little bit up. Even though in my gut, I know they want it three dB up. Um, that's, you know, that, that's, that's probably the biggest gap between a novice and a pro. A pro just like, as in my clients, at least now really appreciate the fact that, uh, I just know what they want. Like they'll, talk to me they'll mm -hmm. tell me something and i've built an intuition to understand yes i get it i know exactly what you want perfect and they even on a revision they'll, they'll love it because they know that you know even though they wanted it a, a little bit louder and i might have went against that i've just done it because i figured a way how to do it to make it sound good and they're happy with it so yeah it's that gap of communication and and, and listening sensibilities oh right on yeah. And I would, I would say I, I feel very similarly about things, especially around like trusting your intuition. And I think that's something where, you know, when you're a novice, you're learning something, you don't necessarily have that sense of ballast. You don't have that sense of internal confidence, uh, sometimes. And, and it's easy to second guess decisions that you're making. Um, and part of it comes down to ear training and, and, you know, that takes, that can take time and, and learning your environment. If you're changing studios or you don't have a great studio or, or the right set of headphones or whatever it is to hear, it's easier to second guess yourself. But eventually you get to a point where you're like, Oh, like, yeah, I do. I trust that I'm hearing what I'm hearing and, and to have the, have the, I guess the, the confidence in yourself to know when to mention something and make it an issue and when not to, too. Um, I've had very occasionally a couple times where I've, I've gone toe to toe with a client and said, Hey, I know you feel really strongly about this. I really think that you might be overlooking something and how I've handled that. Then this very rarely happens. I don't do this very often. Cause I think, you, you know, you'd just be a dick at that point. Nobody would want to work with you. So, you know, 
most of the times I just, I go with what the client wants and, and I try and just give them what they want. But every once in a while, I'll dig in my heels a little bit. And if I do, I'll usually say, hey, here's me doing my best job to give you what it is that you've asked for. And then here's what I think could sound good. And you listen back and forth between the two versions. And if you tell me that what I'm suggesting is totally off base, I will shut my mouth and will go your way. Uh, you're my client. You being happy is what matters at the end of the day. And I've been really surprised, actually, at what's come back. In the few times that I've done it, a lot of times I've had clients say, you know, I I try, I'm coming to you to work with you because I trust your ears. I trust your intuition. And now that I've listened to it, uh, you know, I like this and we're going to go with it. And then I, I've had a couple of times where people have said, yeah, I listened to both of them and um, I really like what I really like version A that 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 was you doing what I'd asked you to do. And I'm going to go with that. I'm like, OK, cool. I respect that. So, yeah, I think we have to be we have to be willing to um, listen to the client for sure, and then and then having the finesse of kind of knowing if it's something worth digging in on at the same time. Yeah. And and the beauty of that is that uh, over time, as you listen to more mixes, you listen to more masters, um, and you work on more projects, you build up that intuition and understanding of it. There's some things I wish I could explain like as in put in a tutorial and explain that I'm hearing, but I can't articulate it because it's almost just like a instinct that's strong. I, I listen to a mix. I know exactly what I have to do. I can't articulate it sometimes, like why that is, because there, there's so many, there's thousands of mixes that have come before it that I've listened to to build up that intuition and know X, Y, Z gets me there. Um, and that's things, especially people who are starting out, have to be exceptionally patient for with themselves. And yeah, I think I'm a bit, I'm, I'm a bit numb to that process now because I don't experience or see it through the lens of it, somebody starting out anymore. You know, I've, I've done yep. that and I, yeah, I, I wish I, I probably should, um, take some time to connect with more people starting out so that way I can understand, you know, really what that process is like for them because um, I, mm -hmm. think, I think we owe it to anybody coming up in this industry. A community is a very healthy thing um, and it helps a lot of people. You know, like th there used to be a time where, where accessing a studio, you, you were completely locked out unless you're an intern or an assistant. You couldn't access that knowledge. It was gate kept. It was only in there. And I think one of the healthiest things about community in it is that the, the more ideas that are propagated out, the more people learn from one another, the more people share each other's experiences um, and do it honestly and faithfully and uh, without uh, trying to sugarcoat things. Um, that allows more introduction for uh, divergent thinking or, or thinking that, that comes off axis and explores new things. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, I did a... Uh, limiter ceiling test, A being encoders, clipping, and now I posted that yesterday the day before, and I didn't cut it from the video. I only got two out of six in the blind A B, and it, and it felt like everybody who was commenting was getting five out of six, and they're like, "What? What? You can't hear it?" And I'm like, "Well, this is part of the process. Is 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 exploring?" And everybody gave their reason how they heard it, and somebody heard it because the clip version sound brighter, and somebody else heard it because the clip version sound duller, according to them. And everybody had a different reason, but it allowed us all to hypothesize together and collect all this sort of knowledge as a community. And then, and then you you get to think about outside the box. How could we? improve on this, do this better, explore this topic. Um, so that's why I think, uh, I think uh, I owe it to, to just in general, because it's something I'm passionate about is helping people just to really delve into the deep with um, some people starting out. Maybe something, I've right got on. a little note here, but yeah, sorry to rant. Yeah, there. cool. And then, no, that's great. That's really um, interesting info. And I mean, I, I'm sure that's a big part of what's driven you to start on YouTube. You know, you're you're a natural teacher. You know what you know, but it's a different skill set to teach. And and you've also got that, um, which is, uh, you know, one of the many reasons I think your videos are being so well received by people. And it's great to see, um, you know, you're 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 willing to go out there and rethink your processes. I've seen that in a lot of your videos. You're going out with an attitude of let's explore this, let's test this, let's see what we can learn from this, and being being willing to to be like, oh, 
well, this was unexpected. I didn't think this was going to happen or, or I didn't hear this happening. And that's, like you said, one of the beautiful parts of, you know, social media and community and, um, and doing what we do. It's, um, it's so easy to get entrenched in a particular way of doing things and just repeat, rinse and repeat. But one of the things I've noticed that you do a lot is you're willing to, you know, say, let's test out a different way of doing it or a new tool or a different plugin and, and really go into the details with it and, you know, open up plugin doctor, or like do the, do the ABCX tests. Um, it's fascinating what you, what you find when you're willing to do that. And you do learn uh, a great deal yourself and also share that knowledge with other people. And the other thing about being on YouTube, is like many times, I don't, you've probably had this experience too. I learn so much from people on YouTube because they catch something that I was doing that I, you know, wasn't correct. You know, I've, I've taught, I've made a lot of blunders over the years on YouTube teaching things that I've totally changed my perspective on later, you know? Um, but that's another one of the, one of the great pieces about community is, uh, you know, the people that you're working with and when, what they can contribute to you as well. Yeah. I, I think of it as like a, a GitHub ar- archive. I'm developing m- my program and then there's forks in the road and everybody's putting their input in and going, oh, you could have done it this way or this way. And then I'm like, okay, let's try version, um, you know, 4.1.7. And, you know, we've we, we tried this, this. And um, I think, I think there's something healthy to uncover there, which um, there's a lot of benefit for the audio community. If, they're open to the exploration of being wrong or accepting new ideas. I, I think there's something that's happening at the moment, at least online, is that uh, so much of what's fueling the content for people consuming audio education is advertising and uh, mm-hmm. affiliateship. And it's like, how can uh, – I'm not going to – I will not say names because I don't think that's that's um, fair – or reasonable for me to make assumptions of how people operate their business. But um, how can somebody love a thousand plugins? It's like, I, I don't, I don't yeah. get that. Like, yeah. like uh, that, that, that's where it's like, and people follow that and they're like, Oh, I need all these tools. I need all these plugins, but it's not really facilitating a discussion around, how we can be better engineers or produce better results is just shiny new toy syndrome. It's like a collector's, um, a collector's den, you know, like, cool. All right. You know, it's a big pawn yeah. shop with all these cool collections, but not necessarily any substance, you know, outside of that. Well, totally. I think you, you made a good point there. there. There's never been so many new tools coming out. It's just their plugins are being released at an unprecedented rate. And, uh, you know, you and I both test plugins. We're in touch with a lot of these companies and, and there's new companies coming up. And yeah, it's, I think one of the, one of the issues out there with, um, a lot of engineers and, and artists and producers is they don't really know, uh, the majority of their tools at a really deep level. And, it's it's one thing to just fire something up and you can intuitively get to know your way around a plugin. It's another thing to read the manual thoroughly, have tested all of like talking about limiters even, like like something like Pro L. It's such a deep, really a deep plugin. Uh understanding the impact of um all of the different modes, understanding the impact of using oversampling or not, using look ahead or not, using, um, you know, talking about plugins that have uh, side chains and e- EQs on the side chains. And there's a, so much nuance to it that if you have 17 limiters and 27 compressors, you're never going to get to know and have mastery of the tools. And I think that's something that definitely sets professionals apart is, you know, when I, for example, when I watch you using a plugin i think there was a video you did on um it was tone projects unisum and you popped Mm. open the bottom panel and you walked through every single one of those very advanced parameters and i've even talked to other mastering engineers and been like hey use unisum they're like yeah i was like you ever open that panel they're like i don't know what any of that stuff does (laughs) and so you know i that to me was like oh okay this is a guy who's really interested in mastery and and knowing everything at a really deep level. And I really like that too. And I'd much rather work with a smaller tool set and know them at that level than, than have, you know, all of these different plugins and tools. And that's actually perhaps re- a really good segue into one of the things I wanted to ask you about, which are, what are the tools that you use that you like can't live without? Um, hmm, I've got a session up in front of me. Oh, no, that's a mixing session. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I know you did a video recently where you were going through your plugin library and you were like, trash, trash, oh, just, trash, trash, yeah. keep, trash, 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 keep. Um, but yeah. yeah, I'm wondering, yeah, just for you as a mastering engineer and as a mixer, you know, like what are your kind of go-to um, tools? I could get away mastering a lot of my projects with standard clip. Um the Sontech 432 or any EQ. It could just be any EQ, a clipper, and um, the Maximizer by Ozone. Ozone. Isotope, sorry. In Ozone, yeah. But um, I could get away with those three. Easy. Easy, easy. The rest I could do edits manually. Um, like, I, 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 I could put a lot of uh, other people you know, to the test, just using those three plugins and they could have all the tools available. I'd be pretty confident I could, you know, go toe to toe. Right on, right on. And what is it about uh, the maximizer in Ozone versus other options um, that you really like? Um, The reason why I chose the maxim, like you don't have a huge amount of flexibility with the maximizer in terms of like what Pro L2 offers you, Um, but it's, so, so the ISC algorithm, actually, I'll talk about, I, I won't talk about the ISC algorithm because that can be very long winded. Um, but basically it's a really good way to flick through modes and get as much distortion or as little distortion as you want from a limiter or as much pumping or as little pumping as you want from a limiter in a very quick amount of time. And it does it very cleanly and it's, and, it, and it's a very good functionality of doing that. Um, that's why in short. Cool. Right on. Um, have you ever, uh, well, I know the IRC, some of the IRC algorithms are multiband, but if have you, have you ex- ever experimented with some of the multiband limiters out there? Like, um, like the DMG limitless. People have sent message me about it. I think you've even mentioned it to me in the past. No, I haven't. Um, not for anything other than the fact that it doesn't fill a need in my process yet, or it doesn't mm-hmm. it, like th- th- there are hundreds of tools out there. Like you said, that you can go out and look at and DMG limitless always comes up. I've even downloaded the demo once, but I never got around to looking at it, but then I've got to go through the whole manual and really understand it. And I go, is the friction to get into understanding this tool solving a problem that I don't even have? Like, it's like, I, I, I don't know the gap that it would, that, that it would solve for me right now. Um, and in short, no, I don't look at multiband limiters. Don't yeah, know why? Yeah. It just it's never it's never an issue. Like, yeah, with 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 ozone maximize, I'm doing like 1.5 dB a game reduction or two when it's getting super hot, and even then, it's like it's it's not making so much of a huge difference to my sound that it's compelling me to go elsewhere. Right. So even on some of your, um, well, actually, I wanted to talk to you about your T-shirt actually, because that was uh, that could be a cool segue into talking about uh, you know the realm that we're talking about now, kind of loudness and limiters and tools for that. Um, tell me about the T-shirt. Oh, the anti loudness loudness club. So this was um, yeah. just something I designed because I liked the idea of doing like my own parody of the antisocial social club but with loudness in it, because I thought that's actually pretty funny because like that's pretty representative of every mastering engineer would, would be in the anti-loudness loudness club because we all, you know, have to face that sort of, you know, issue um, in, in our in our career. Um, so that's the T-shirt. I just made it and I liked it and it's cool. I can't sell it as merch because it's probably trademarked and I'll get in a lot of trouble if I did. So yeah, this is mine. For sure. Um, yeah. and, but it's, it's so cool. I am getting more made up just for myself because I like wearing it yeah. and it's, and it's a fun conversation starter, but that's about as yeah. far as it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, neat. Well, in, in terms of loudness, I wanted to ask you, are you, are you in the work that you're doing for mastering clients and labels? Um, are you having people come to you and request certain levels of loudness or are you kind of given more creative freedom just to master it to where you think it sounds the best and then you send it back to them? Are you, are you noticing? Um, um, yeah, what are you noticing there? So it's, so it's, it's, it's case by case by so situationally for like the vast majority, people just trust me to do my own thing and I do my own thing and it's great. Um, uh, more specifically when that discussion happens, 
sent off a master the other day. It was negative 10 LUFs integrated. And for some reason, the producer said they wanted negative 11. Cool. Okay. All right. If that's what you want. It didn't make it sound worse. No. Um, it didn't sound better because it was negative 10. It didn't sound worse because it was negative 11. It was just what it finished on and they wanted a negative 11. So um, all I did was pull down the ceiling and, and that was it. And we we're, were there. We we're good. Um, and I have that every now and then. The only one I sort of push back with if I've got like a really loud dance record, which is the mix itself is like negative 11 luffs and then I've mastered and it's negative nine or negative eight. That's not really loud, but it's typical for a lot of those masters. Um, and they want negative 14 for Spotify. Then I'm like, okay, well, I can even hand you back the mix and you're not going to get that. So like, you know, let's, yeah. let's discuss this. <laughs> uh, for certain labels, so I do some stuff for uh, uh, C-pop um, and K-pop and stuff like that. That always has to be blasting loud. That's just like an expectation. So they don't even request it. You just know that the A&R or the producer is going to pull it up in their door against something else that is released. They're not going to level match it. They're going to play it back. It's not a bad thing because they're usually produced in a way that makes that easy and accessible. Um, and yeah, those, those, those are situations... That where those discussions happen. Yeah. What's the, uh, what's the loudest master you've ever made? And you don't have to say who it's for or what it is, but I'm just curious. Uh, probably like negative four integrated long-term. Like if that's pretty loud, because like the loudest spots are like negative two and a half, negative three. That's a very big outlier. That is not a common thing. Yeah. That's like a huge no outlier. It was probably electronic music. I'm uh, imagining. Yeah, it was like a, a trap dubstep. I, I don't know how to explain. I'm, I'm not too in the weeds of the subgenres and genres of the subgenres. It's just sort of like it was electronically produced music and it was loud and you could hear it was loud just because of the way it was even before I ever mastered it. It was destined to be there. Yeah. As a side note, a weird outlier, speaking of weird outliers, I had a client um, send me a reference track Um it was uh, Gnarls Barkley, crazy. Um, and uh, I I looked at how loud it was and I was thinking, you know, it's negative 10, negative eight luffs or something like that uh, in the in the chorus. It was it was negative four um, in the chorus. And I was just like, holy shit. <laughs> I was like, it's not the type of song you'd expect to be uh, to be that loud. So I was I was really shocked. And it sounded pretty good. Didn't sound like it was really uh making crazy compromises to get there. But uh, yeah, that was a, that was a shocker for me to have that come in as a reference and be like, I had to check all my settings in my mastering session to be like, did I have a gain stage down after my limiter somewhere in my, in what I'm doing when I listen to this track full blast, it was nuts. Yeah. It's actually funny when you, when you come into the studio and you listen to things that you're used to hearing out of the studio, the other, yesterday I was mixing a song and they gave me a reference. I won't say the artist, but you've probably heard the artist. You've probably heard the, the record um, because it's top 40, big, big record. And I hear it all the time in the car. I enjoy it. I jam out. I crank my speakers in the car and it sounds great. And then I had the reference in the in the studio um, for this mix I was doing and I'm listening to it and I'm like, this shit sounds horrible. Like as in on, mm. a, on a technical, like, like listening to my mix and then this other mix, I was like, what the hell is going on? And it's just been pushed and cranked within inches of its life. And it's, and it's actually funny because it actually – tells a story about we're in the weeds with what we do as engineers, very passionate about driving towards something that's exceptional. Okay. Um, because we place importance and respect on our craft, but ultimately it's not as important as everything else that happens around the release of a record, including the artist, the melody of the song, their fans, how they connect with it. So, uh, you know, like, there are records that have been out there that, that sound horrible, but they do such great numbers simply because it's a good song or the artist is really connected with their fans. So it's, it's, it's humbling when I hear that because it's like I hear a record, I'm like, this song did well because it's a great song, not because they ever needed the best engineering on it. Um, it just puts things in perspective because we can get our, in our own little world sometimes. Totally. Um, speaking of your studio really quickly, I wanted to ask you, um, 
what you're are you working um mostly on monitor speakers or are you what what role do headphones play in your process because i saw a video of yours about um you said in the video some i think was the title you said you used to hate headphones but now you have seven pairs of them or something like that i'm curious what your what your monitoring um system is like in in your studio yeah so the studio is exclusively like i've got i've got all my headphones here funnily enough but i i tend to exclusively only use the monitors um at the studio headphones were always an outlier because I just never, I, I couldn't use them. They, they were all rubbish. Um, then lockdown happened and I'm like, okay, uh, bad luck. Uh, I got to figure out something on headphones at least before I get to the studio because I could still transit to and fro the studio, but I just couldn't leave. I was usually leaving at like three thirty four in the morning to get to the studio um, and because I had time curfews here in Melbourne, I couldn't do that. So I had, and that, that was when I would do all my listening sessions. So I got Odysseys and I'm like, oh, wow, I haven't heard a pair of headphones like this. And that sort of opened the floodgates. And um, now headphones are a travel thing. So I'll bring the MM500s whenever I'm on holiday. That They're really good um, for QCing or making edits and whatnot. Um I might have, I haven't traveled with them on a plane yet. I've only brought the LCD ones with me on a plane. Um, so they're just like a, a secondary, like I'm away from the studio. I've got to listen to something. I've got to make a decision or make an edit. Yeah. Oh, actually, I did mix a whole record on the, uh, funnily enough. Um, so if you search a Goong Mango Gut, it's a really awesome mix. I did it. Um, but sweet. I mix that. That's the coolest story about mixing it though. Um, my wife was in labor for seven days at the hospital oh, and God. my assistant had prepped everything for me. The deadline was coming up and I didn't really want to run away from the studio to do it. So I had my laptop, the Odyssey MM 500s and my AirPods. Um, so I got like everything technically lined up on the MM 500s, like the levels and like any edits and things to, to things. I was like, Oh, this vocal needs a bit of tweaking or whatnot. And then I listened to the mix and then after visiting hours, I went back to the studio quickly, had a listen. I hated the mix, went back the next morning. Again, this is like seven days. It took me three days to mix while we're in the hospital because I just was away from the studio the whole that time. Then I mixed it on my AirPods after I did all my technical stuff with the MM500s. I did the final mix on the AirPods and what you hear on the final record is pretty much mixed on these and it sounds awesome. And that's because the, the AirPods... Um, funny story about headphones because we're talking about headphones. I only got the AirPods to do stuff and start learning Dolby Atmos. So that's why I got the AirPods. So I could audition it with yep. spatial head tracking. Then they started living with me whenever I went to the gym. Then they started living with me whenever I went for walks. Then they started living with me when I'm doing house chores and stuff around the house. So now I'm so used to the sound of them that I, I, I can almost, I can't do the technical stuff on it, but for the feel of a mix, I can audition them on here and just know how to dial it in. And it's, it's a really good record. Uh, gut, a gung mango. I'm not trying to like, uh, do, uh, advertising there. It's just like, it's a good, it's a good mix that I know if you listen to. Yeah. You something that you're really so happy with. Energy. And proud of oh, yeah. you did. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's cool. Well, it's, it's neat. Cool. It's kind of like your version of the car test then, because it's like whatever listening environment you get to know really well that you're doing general listening on. And also, I think that AirPods are an important reference point because um, I think a good portion of the end listener audience is going to be experiencing music, at least partially on AirPods, yeah. if not entirely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think uh, uh, they sold 58 million units last year of AirPods, like something, a stupid number in, in, ridiculous number and and it's only becoming exponential year over year with the amount they're selling so it's like it's a no-brainer like it's a real no-brainer to um ha i think if, i actually honestly think uh if you've already got a studio set up and you're considering headphones but you like your monitors get airpods just get airpods start listening to them everywhere because um yeah, you'll hear things that you otherwise wouldn't have, and they're an insane reference. And they're also a really good product. I think headphones, like the, the Odyssey ones are great. Don't get me wrong. I think they're, they're, they're beautiful to listen to on. But user friendliness is like completely out the window with five pin cables you're going to plug in and plug out. And it's like, really? Whereas yeah. these, you just sort of like, I, I can just sit them on a wireless charger, take them with me, pop them in my ear, pop them out. It's all yeah. async, like all synchronizers, like you, like, Really good product, Odyssey, great sounding products, but 
the plugs and all the bits and pieces and the clunky case. It's like, it's cool, but it's not, it's not something yeah, you can do You're not taking it to day. a coffee shop with you usually. <laughs> no, even when you're in the shops, you're not going to sit like, you get out of the car, you're not going to be like, oh, let me open up my Odyssey box and put my headphones on and plug them in and then I'll go do my shopping. Like, you know, like you're not going to spend 10 minutes getting set up just so you can do a shop. These you just have in your pocket or throw in the glove box of your car. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, the, I don't, um, the ones I end up using actually, they're out of print now, but they're the Odyssey, um, Euclid IEMs. And so those are what I use yeah. when I'm, when I'm running around. They're just little, little earbuds that pop in. They're cabled, but uh, they have a Bluetooth, um, they have a Bluetooth connection for them that you can use if you want to. And that's kind of what I've done because I also find, I mean, the AirPods have, um, background noise rejection on them but with the odyssey the euclids at least they just pop in and they actually it's a physical barrier um as part of the iem so that's what i use that when i want something small because yeah the same thing i have like all, most of the odyssey headphones because i work with them quite frequently uh, but i'm never taking one of those big cases with me out to a coffee shop or on the airplane it would be like a piece of carry-on luggage well man that sounds like a crazy experience with your wife being in labor for seven days and uh needing to adapt your workflow but it's you know covid did that to a lot of people too right like it's just that's w where i started working on headphones i mean I, i'd always had headphones as one of my referencing points but i had um just before just before covid i had to disassemble my previous studio and move and i had intended to move into this temporary space for a month and then COVID happened and I ended up being there for three years and I didn't have a, a professional room to work in. I had this little bedroom that I put up some prefab panels in and I had a couple monitors, but it really wasn't anything close. There was so much low frequency decay in the room still that it was almost unusable. So I started switching over to working in headphones and uh, yeah, so for three years I was doing all my mixing and mastering in, in Odyssey um, headphones at that point in time and really got to know them and went back and forth and yeah i was messing up the mixes there was quite an application uh, acclimation process but i just did kind of what andrew sheps talked about doing a lot when he was learning how to do his work on headphones and he was just like i made a mix decision in the headphones and then i listened to it on the speakers and then if i hear something that needs to change i go back to the headphones and i make the change on the headphones and listen to what it sounds mm. like on the headphones not making the change on the speakers and, and by this process of going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between speakers and headphones you eventually kind of learn how they operate differently um yeah and then for me using crossfeed um applications like can opener became a really key part of the process um as well because it's su such a weird difference in the sound stage when you have binaural presentation versus um stereo presentation at a, at a at a 30 degree toe in um very very different sound stage so getting used to being able to make stereo field and panning decisions in headphones took me quite some time as well mm. yeah i never used any of those crossfit applications um, i don't know why i don't have anything against them i just similar to the dmg limitless it's like is this pro solving a problem that i think i have yeah and it's like no nah, i'm pretty cool with the way they operate I, I don't need to delve into it just yet totally um so i wanted to talk about a, a few technical things so i, I was curious because um one of the things that i'd seen um in one of your videos was um positioning of plugins um you've done some things that i hadn't seen before in terms of how you order plugins in your chain um, one of those things, just as an example, was putting your clipper first in chain um, versus uh, maybe how I've seen it more frequently and how I've done a lot of it is putting it right before the limiter to ease the load on the limiter. I was wondering if you could just talk a bit about kind of like yeah, signal chain in, 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 your, in your mastering chains and, and what orders you're finding you're typically placing certain plugins like EQ, saturators, clippers, limiters in and, and some of the rationale there. Understanding, mm -hmm. of course, that nothing is formulaic and it's going to change, but I'm just wondering if there's anything you can share that, you know, you, you kind of find yourself doing this for these reasons more so than another order. Yeah, I, I like to have my clipper up front first. I'm not doing a great deal amount of clipping, but uh, the more consistent the sample peaks are, the more consistent your compressors work. The more consistent your limiters work, yep. your multiband compressors work. Um, it's consistency state. So I know that if I've got, you know, offshoots and peaks happening on every snare drum here, 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 I know if I can 
control because because it, it might be like a, a drum rhythm especially like with live recording music where it's like sporadic where a snare drum just pops off and then you're playing and then another snare drum pops off and then if you've got to compress a set to that guess what happens like your snare drum's consistent and then everything ducks and your snare drum and then so i'm like well why am i going to give myself that headache flip up front um that way i can get things into a generally controlled state um that's why i clip up front the counter argument that some people have for that is that it can, if you're introducing processes that cause any phase rotation, you move the clipping onto the side of the waveform. Yeah. But you have to do a great deal of phase rotation. You need either full low cuts or full, you know, uh, you know, full passes of information to happen where you're rotating the waveform enough that that's actually an issue. When you're doing a decibel yep. boost to the mid range or half a decibel boost to the low mids, um, then it's not much of an issue. Yeah. And then if you are going to do something Gentle like touches. a... Yeah. If you're going to do something like a high pass, just put it before the clipper. Done. You don't have to stress about it. That's why I usually have the clipper first. Um, then after that, I've got... Uh, usually compression. It's funny because I still... <laughs> I did the tests and I did tests of using an EQ and compressor, either EQ first comp- into a compressor or compressor first into an EQ. Did them all level tested and... Um, the results, unless you're using things that are tonally being driven by gain, um, the results of just using general compression, general EQ, which one first, which one not next, is indifferent. Um, there are differences, but I'm talking about the overall effect is indifferent. I used to think, oh, if I make a 4 dB bell curve in the middle and then I compress it, I'm compressing that 4 dB bell curve into itself whereas it's not the actual fact because when you're compressing you're compressing the whole entire signal up and down not just that part of the information so i still compress first and then eq even though i know that because i'm using very transparent processing i'm not doing anything that's driving a tone into a compressor or into an eq even though i know i can switch it up so that, that's sort of like it doesn't matter which way it goes but i just do it that way out of habit um and then that usually goes like, I do use the guide particle a little bit, even though there's issues with that in its own sake. Uh, but I sort of like it as a reference point. Sometimes I just drive the mix into the guide particle to see how it's metering, and then I'll turn the guide particle off. Because I sort of like the feel it can push the direction of something in. And then I've got my final processing, which is limiting after that. What What's your take on um, on using saturation on a master? I know um, you interviewed Luca... Uh, and you were really keen on his uh, dynamic um, saturation plugin, um, mm. and I was just wondering, uh, yeah, are you finding you're ever ever using saturation, like a dedicated saturator, midside saturator, parallel saturator on on your masters? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, like anything, it's a tool. It's not a necessary tool for every master. I do use the diamond saturator sometimes. That that that's got its own setting. Uh, dynamic two, and then you use the expansion driving into it. You can get some nice clickiness out of kicks, um, which is cool. But more so, let, let, let's forget about that. Sat- saturation as a tool in mastering is usually just solve a specific problem set. The Michelangelo EQ is really good because if you see me use that, you can pull the drop down menu, go uh, transient sustain, mid, side, the band that you want, EQ a drive and actually pull different tone out of different elements. But that's usually because I'm trying to fill a void that isn't there or I'm trying to embellish something that is there. It's not because I need it there, period, across every master. It's usually because, oh, you know, I need a bit more punch out of this kick, um, but the mix is all right. So maybe I just want to affect the transient portion of it. So then I'm getting Michelangelo in to do that. Um, I'm not and that's the Tone Projects, the new Tone Projects one, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the, the Tone Projects one, which I think yep. they've done. Like, when it comes to uh, thinking outside the box, pun intended, um, they've taken an emulation and added some features which make it very good to take and carry forward into trying things that you otherwise couldn't, period. Um, which is good. So yeah. saturation is something that's there as a tool like anything else is but it's not a necessity it's not i I don't i don't like the idea of um, people saturating masters for the sake of it because you change so much when you do that yeah exactly yeah and you can get uh it it can get pretty heavy-handed on a on a master and then get into intermodulation distortion and and stuff yeah yeah the the only thing you absolutely need in a master is a limiter that's it 
and not even for the sake of driving level, just so for the fact that you have no samples going over and clipping when you export. So, like, that should be the yep. only thing that you must absolutely have. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah, fair. Cool. Well, we just got a couple minutes left, and I think... um it would. Be, I've loved what we've talked about so far, and I feel like you and I could just talk forever. Um, but um, I'd like to hear a little bit about, you know, what what's it like um, being in the industry in 2024? You know, you're you're a mastering engineer, you're a mix engineer, and you're a thought leader on YouTube. You balance a lot of things. Um, yeah, what, what's 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 it like being being in the industry at, in the current times? It's good. I. You know what? I said this pre-2020 before things went to shit for everybody, um, which which was horrible to see. I, it, it, was, it, was dis, it, was, it was a bit of a uncomfortable time because I think we all had a friends or family or somebody we knew going through something as a result of it. Um, but before then, and now I'm in the same mindset where, you know, the mastering engineers, uh, uh, the music industry um, is a great place to be operating in. Um, it's your mindset draws the people in and the community in around you that you want to have. Um, if everything is so sad and so horrible, you know, you're going to attract those people into your, into your life, engaging in a career in this, and that's going to bring you down. But if, if you have a positive mindset on things and you're engaged in being constructive and open and willing to try new things and build things, um, that's valuable. And that building doesn't have to necessarily be like an application or a plugin. It can just be building your skill set so you can be the best producer, the best mixing engineer, the best beat maker you can possibly be. You'll attract that in return where you'll find people coming into your circle who have the same mindset and want to build great things with you. Um, and that, that that's, um, that's something I just think uh, people miss because they're all, all trying to chase a finish line and there isn't any finish line. It's sort of like if, if you're happy, all the people who are really good at doing this in the music industry or doing really well in the music industry, for the most part, uh, especially that are coming up now, are happy people in terms of not like happy, I don't know what's going on in their lives, but they're happy to be here doing the job they're doing because they're excited about it. They've got a thirst for that knowledge. They've got a thirst for driving some positivity into into their work. And I think that's a that's what people should take from it uh, rather than trying to find how to make six figures in 12 months being a music producer. They should be trying to chase, do I actually want to do this? And if I do, what gets me excited to get out of bed every day to do it? And that, that will naturally lead you into things that can produce results. Yeah. Well said the, the mindset piece and, and, um, doing doing something that inspires you is great well speaking of uh, this will be my last question for you and then we'll wrap up um speaking of things that inspire you and kind of the direction that you're going where are you headed in the next year like what's one of your really big goals what are you working on on personally professionally that's that's really focal for you so i'm very fortunate that the mastering side of my business takes care of itself now so i don't outside of developing my skill sets there i don't have to like push and drive to get more business in that sort of takes care of itself. M- my thing is, is, is thinking about, uh, so I do content on YouTube, but considering how I can produce something of value through that content that helps people or is transformative for them. I'm not saying an app. I'm not saying a plugin. I, th- I think plugins have always been on the cards, but that's not necessarily the gateway to that. Um, that whole process in the next year of, trying to deliver more value to the community and the audience sort of doesn't fall on the delivery mechanism. It sort of falls on my responsibility to put in the effort. So I think the next 12 months is just me putting in the effort to navigate those waters of how can I produce something that's valuable that helps other people um, in my content and in the way I deliver that content, the mechanism of that might change. I'm not sure, but it's just focused on creating something and, a message that can help people navigate and move forward. I know that's very ambiguous, but that's like what's in my mind at the moment, genuinely. No, I get it, man. I get it. And I, I can say, honestly, I've seen you putting your foot down on that accelerator. I've watched, you know, um, I don't watch every single one of your videos because you put out so many of them. It's like, I can't even keep up with all your videos, but I've, I watch a lot of them and I've definitely noticed the pace at which you're producing videos and the things you're talking about. And, um, 
yeah, you're, you're one of the main reasons why we're talking is I think you're one of the people on YouTube that is doing the industry a really huge service. You're giving a lot of your own personal skills and expertise. You're elevating everybody around you. And um, it's really great to see you digging into that and that that's a big part of your focus, man. So thank you for everything that you do. And thank you so much for your time today. Ah, thank you. It's, it was a real, it was a real, real pleasure. I'm really glad that you, um, you reached out and, you know, in, in, in all lessons, kept open lines of communication to make this happen. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure, man. So, um, where are the best places for people to engage with you, follow you, subscribe to what you do? Obviously your YouTube channel, which is, um, panorama mixing and mastering, um, what other places would you like people to um, connect with you? So uh, one space which is fun for my ego is is my Instagram page, which is at panorama underscore mastering. And the reason why it's fun is because I just share the records I'm working on. Um, so it's cool because I like the credits. I like everybody seeing, oh, this artist or that mixing engineer worked. I'm like, that's just the ego side of things. And it's fun because you get to see other people in the industry, gives them visibility. So uh, on Instagram at panorama underscore mastering. Um, the YouTube channel is one place I'm really trying to deliver value. My newsletter is, um, I'll leave a, I can send you a link where people can find that. And I, I hope sure. you're on it because you'd be enjoying it. If you are, are you part of the newsletter yet, Drew? I, th- I don't know if I am actually, it's funny how you follow that's... people in certain places and then you just realize you're like, Oh, oh my no. God, you have an Instagram too, or you have, so that's a good no, reminder. No, no, no. I will get on your no, email it, list. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's good fun because, um, the email list, for me is sort of like a journal or brain thought catalog of all the things that don't make it to the YouTube channel. Um, and it's a slow grind for me. It's not as, as fast paced as the YouTube channel, but uh, do you know when you wake up in the morning, you open up YouTube, you're trying to find something that uh, gets you excited about the day, or, you know, there might be a particular podcast you listen to or something. That's what I'm trying to make that email newsletter into. Like it's, it's generally my excitement for the day. So I'm hoping that, uh, and the reason why I suggest it so strongly or I'm pushing on that fact strongly is because I know that when people subscribe to the list and I send out an email, they'll wake up in the morning, they'll read the email and it won't be a sales pitch or anything. It, it's just something that they'll start their day and they'll be, it'll tickle their interest or their intrigue, especially if they're a curious engineer, because uh, that's all I'm doing. And I'm just journaling going, oh, the other day I looked at Subloom and I'm like, oh, this is what this warp feature is doing. And that was this morning I sent that email. And then I'm like, Oh, but you could rebuild it using these plugins and then you could do all this other stuff, but it's a really cool concept because the warp feature in it um, tilts the harmonic signal. So it's like a tilt for the harmonic signal that it's processing. So I'm like, gotcha. okay, well, let's take the delta signal of the exciter and then add an EQ after it, but then we can use the delta of the transient or the delta of the sustain or the delta of the side signal and then filter that into another processor. It's like, it's just fun stuff. So yeah, I, I blabbed on nice. about that, but the newsletter... The newsletter is 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 a very exciting part of my world at the moment. Well, it's neat because uh, you're doing something different on the newsletter than you are on other social channels, which is which is awesome. It's nice actually to see that you're doing different content there. So yeah, YouTube it's at Panorama Mastering, Instagram at Panorama underscore Mastering, um, and the email list which they can sign up for on your website, right? Yeah, on my website. Um, I'll oh, give cool. you a link and you can you can run with that. I'll put it below in the video description. Awesome. Well, let's wrap up there. Um, there's so many more things that I would love to ask you about, but maybe we'll save that for some future session if we link up again. Um, huge thanks um, for all of your time. Amazing insights. Uh, my mind is already spinning the wheels just listening to a lot of the stuff that you've said. Can't wait for your upcoming videos uh, as well. And um, yeah, man, wishing you a super successful 2024. Awesome. Thank you. 